Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Unchurched. We are back, Joe Simons, like diamonds. And this is a special one. We're bringing back the guy who kicked off this entire series of unchurched pastor johnny kelly what's up man not much man how are you doing salt strong it is good to be back yeah I like, I like that shirt by the way i know i love this one this is like my favorite salt yeah. strong t-shirt it's so soft uh <laughs> I, I love it. i mean i, I and plus i i my other ones are just getting a little threadbare i wear them too much uh <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> You know, I've, I've worn the college one enough to where I'm getting my doctorate now. Uh, you know, I, I wear it enough, uh, although I'm, I'm probably not good enough to get a doctorate. It's like an honorary doctorate. Uh, uh, I'm not a good enough fisherman to be a doctor fisherman. You've, uh, you've, you've been busy and we're going to talk, talk <laughs> about that. Um, and it's, it's funny how uh, it seems like God, you know, puts, I, and I pray every morning that God puts the, the right people right in my path. Sometimes I even I write it down saying in my lap. Uh, just to make it so obvious who I need to be connecting with and talking with and, and doing business with. And you sent me a text out of the blue just last night and uh, I hadn't talked to you in a while. And I thought about you and I was like, oh, so cool. And I forgot to even respond to you. And I woke up this morning and I'm sitting there just going through our insider community. And the very first post was one of our members who found the, our original uh, podcast that we did is, uh, is God real. And, and I was like, all right, this is a sign. And so I was like, you know what, Johnny, we've the last few texts I looked, it was like, we said, Hey, yeah, it'd be cool. Let's get on a podcast together. And we never made it happen. I was like, let's do it today. Like right now. And you're like, all right, cool. Let's make it happen. So here we are. You've, uh, you've kind of talked about this, uh, this idea of, uh, you know, letting God write our story. And, and, uh, and I know there's, you know, even quite a few hints of that in the, in the Bible, about, you know, letting God, letting Jesus write our story, not just, you know, kind of maybe be a part of it on, you know, on a Sunday here and there. Um, and you you had a kind of a four-part series. And we're going to kind of combine it into one, one that you did at, at your church there. So I, I, I'd, I'd love for you to kind of take over and uh, and tell us what that means and maybe some stories behind it and what we can learn from this. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, stories are so important that we, we, we forget about, you know, we, we, we almost take them for granted, you know, but, uh, I mean, good stories are part of, they're not just something that we enjoy. Um, they really are a, the, what, what God wants us. I mean, our lives tell a story, the story of our lives. And, and, you know, throughout the Bible, Jesus, he didn't, you know, preach in these and nows. He, 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 he spoke in stories. He told parables. I mean, he, he understood the idea of uh, the story. And, and I think that, I mean, we all love a good story. Um, you know, Hollywood shows us that, I mean, like, it, it's just you know, what we do. And I, I think we, we all like good stories and it's, it's, it's always fun. You know, we get together. I, I have heard it said, you know, like the, the lowest form of communication is the remember when's, you know, like, rem, you know, but, but it's, it's also not just that it's the idea of being able to say, I have to tell you about the time when, and then you tell the story and every single one of us have a story that we, our lives are going to tell. And, uh, and some of us have, most of us have lots of stories. Uh, and some of them we're very proud of and very excited about and other times, other ones that we're not. Um, I think we all have those as well. Those, those stories that we don't want to share my 20, my, basically my twenties. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think for most of us, <laughs> some, are, I did some dumb, dumb things, bad ideas. Yeah. We, we did some really stupid things and, and it's just the way it is, you know, and, uh, you know, the idea of, of being able to say, let me tell you about the story about how, you know, there was a problem in my life and I overcame it. Uh, let me tell you about that time that I set a goal and I accomplished it. Let me tell you about the time that, that I made the right decision instead of the wrong decision. Let me tell you about this funny time that when I did something really stupid, you know, I have a lot of those stories, the times when I did something really stupid, you know, and I mean, we just, we just all have a story. Um, you know, just being able to tell those like little simple stories from our, our family. Uh, you know, I, I love, 
I love being able to tell those kinds of stories, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, these positive things that we love to share and then others that we don't want to share. Um, ones that make us look dumb or, uh, or worse ones where we, we just legitimately, legitimately were dumb, uh, you know, in, in these sort of seemingly small, insignificant things. I mean, some of my favorite stories are, are, are based on that kind of stuff. And, and these things that we do, they really result in, uh, the things that we do now result in life altering directions. And I think so many times we look at the idea of like th this sort of 30,000 foot view of our lives, because we're, we're always looking right at the very moment of our life instead of looking to the overall thing of it. And, 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 and we're looking right now and ignoring the big picture of our lives that, 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 that today is not the story of your life, that the story of your life is, is much bigger than that. Um, and, and, and we act like that, that we have to make these gigantic life altering changes to make a good story. And that I think for so many people is overwhelming. Uh, it's just too big. Um, but the thing is, is that, that the, the truth is, is that these, these small insignificant decisions we make every day they really are what result in like life altering direction. Uh, they change, you know, the idea of like, I was invited to this party and this happened. I was invited to church and this happened. I took this class and this happened. I took this, I had this conversation and this happened. Like for me, marrying my wife, Sarah, I was, I was in my thirties. Uh, Sarah was in her thirties. We both had reached that age where most of our friendship circles were married, had kids. <clears throat> and we were both sort of, at that point where we had resigned ourselves to like, I guess I'm going to be single. Like really that's, we were just there. We were just like, and it wasn't like, like a sad decision. It was like, Oh, I would have loved to have gotten married, but I guess that's just not for me. Um, and I was about to start traveling and doing some ministry around the country. And I moved back to Lakeland. I, I, I quit my position at the church I was at in Miami and I moved back to Lakeland and I was going to be leaving about six or eight weeks later out of Lakeland and I would be gone for the next 10 months. I was just going to be gone. And uh, I happened to be walking through church one day. And as I'm walking through the lobby of church, I see um, this, this woman and her husband, and I know him, I've known him for years. Um, and they're normally people I would do. They, I wasn't close friends with them. Normally I would just sort of wave and say hi and just keep walking. But in that moment, I made the decision to walk over to say hi, to shake their hand. And in doing so, she says, I have somebody you should meet. <laughs> and and I, it was this insignificant decision. And I remember her telling me this. I have a friend and she didn't tell me her name, didn't tell me anything about her. But for some reason in, in that moment, I was intrigued. And so I went to another friend of mine at the church and went, hey, so-and-so wants me to meet somebody. Do you but she won't tell me who, who is it that she wants me to meet? And he goes, Oh, she wants you to meet Sarah. That's her best friend. I know that's who she wants me to meet. And I asked my friend, I was like, is, is that a good thing? And he goes, Oh yeah. Like, like she's really a cool, she's a really cool chick. Like she's really cool. Uh, she's good looking, sweetheart, like all the, like all the good things. I was like, okay. And so then I did what any normal human being does at that moment, which is like Facebook stalker. Um, you know, sort of become a creeper for a minute, you know, it, 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 I, I, in the end, I'm not a creeper because we got married. Um, had we not gotten married, I would have just been creepy. Uh, but I remember like uh, her friend didn't want to introduce us yet. She was nervous about that. And, and, but I found out that, that Sarah sang in the choir. So I, the next Wednesday night when they were rehearsing, I like went and got all dressed up. I, I went to like Ross and bought a new sweater. Oh yeah. And, uh, and then I stopped at Walgreens on the way to church to use the tester cologne, uh, you know, like, like the smells like obsession stuff. Um, so I'd smell good. I looked good. And I, I go to the choir practice room towards the end of their practice. And I'm like, it has those like the doors, the little like windows that are like long and little, and I'm peeking through the window and I see her and I'm like, yeah, she's good looking. 
And uh, and I'm like, wait, and then they, they I wait, wait till they end choir practice and they all start walking towards this door that I'm at. And so then I run back around the corner and I wait the proper amount of time and I just come walking down the hallway like, oh, I just happened oh, to be doing something. You I guys are here. I didn't know you guys were practicing. Yeah, I run into Sarah and and we talked for a few minutes and I said, you want to go grab coffee tomorrow night? And she said, yeah. This insignificant decision for me to walk up and talk to this person that I normally wouldn't do has led to me being married to the most incredible woman in the world, three kids, uh, somebody who has supported my ministry and what God has called us to do as a family for the last decade. This insignificant decision that has determined the story that I tell tomorrow. And, 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 and that's sort of how we live today will tell the story and, 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 and really honestly, how do, and the question that I asked our church and that I would say to you guys is like, how do we live the story that we want to tell? Like, how do we do that? And, and, and it, I believe it comes down to the simple idea that we let God be the one to write the story. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, that's my favorite chapter in the Bible. I love Hebrews, and I love Hebrews chapter 12 specifically. It's my favorite chapter in the Bible. Um, in, in one of the verses, in verse 2, it says, let, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, meaning he's the one who writes um, He writes everything for us. He writes the story. And so the idea is I, I decided to start writing the story. That, that Jesus wants us to write, you know, and, 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 and uh, what I did is I talked throughout this, this whole idea of, of sometimes God wants us to start something. Sometimes God needs us to stop something. Sometimes we need to go somewhere. Sometimes we need to stay somewhere. And so um, uh, today, I, or right now, I'm, what I'm talking about is like not really following our dreams. Uh, I'm not talking about like writing a book or starting a business or anything, but I'm talking about like these small disciplines, deciding to start doing something because it leads to a bigger thing. Um, it's the idea of like a, a, a keystone habit. Like, you know, like if you look at, I love watching like the history channel and they talk about having a keystone. Like, like if you go to like these old, old buildings, like the white house or something like that. And they would, they would spend weeks putting down one single stone for the foundation. They call it the keystone mm -hmm. and they have to get it exactly perfect. Because the rest of the foundation, the rest of the building, I mean, the roof is dependent on, upon this one single stone, this one single thing. And these keystone habits, um, these decisions we make lead to the bigger things. Um, you know, like the best example I can give, or maybe not the best, but one of the examples I can give is the idea of, like, I, uh, I drive an old Suburban. Uh, I, I love working on cars and I have an old school and old body style, like square body suburban. And I love yeah. it. Oh dude, it's the cool. tank. It is a tank, <laughs> uh, it, but it uses more gas than a tank. Um, it's <laughs> not fun right now. Um, yeah. but in, and I like to keep it clean. I like to clean my suburban and it's not because I really care about necessarily having the cleanest car. Uh, and I, what I mean clean is like cleaning the inside of it. Uh, uh, I, I really don't care that much about necessarily having the cleanest car, but I keep it clean because, because I know me and I know that's the sort of the first discipline to go in my life. Because when I do keep the inside of my car clean, uh, which I don't necessarily always want to do, I don't always want to, you know, and especially three kids and a wife and a church and all this other stuff, you know, a lot of times for me to keep my car clean, I'll wait till Sarah goes to bed and I'll drive down to, um, you know, a car wash where I can clean it out and vacuum it out or something like that, or I'll, you know, take it a morning after the kids have gone to school and I'll go out in the driveway and I'll clean it out. And, and, and I do that. Uh, I, I do that because I know it's the first thing to go. And, and when I do that, I feel disciplined. Um, and because I do that, and since, so since I'm being disciplined, my mind also says in that moment, like, it's important for me to be active in what I do. Because when I do that, then I feel better. And, and, and then when I feel better, I, I, I eat better. And I take care of my body. Since I'm being active, I, I, you know, I get up in the morning and I'm, I, I feel a little bit better about it. It makes, me, 
it makes me be a little healthier. And when I, when I'm that way, it, it makes me sleep better. And I know I'm, it's sort of drawn out on this thing, but, but when I sleep better, I wake up better in the morning and, and, and then I can feel more comfortable doing, you know, my daily Bible reading in the morning. And I, and I, and then when I do that, I, I, I end up living my day sort of in the presence of God because I did the right things first thing. And, and, and because I, in, in the presence of God during my day, I become more productive in what I'm doing. Uh, and when I'm more productive in what I'm doing, I'm in a better mood. I see Sarah and I say, you're awesome and life is good and everything's better. And, and, and I see Sarah and I, you know, she's awesome. And, and we have these awesome kids and, and, and all of these things all, you know, in, in a roundabout way can be tied back to the fact that I kept my suburban clean. Uh, and, and, and the idea, and this is sort of, it's sort of like a drawn out explanation, but basically like these little things that we do have bigger results than just having a clean car. Mm -hmm. They lead to it's these little habits and the opposite happens too. Like when we make the wrong small decisions, we know that those snowball, we know that, right? Like the idea of, I made the decision to do that one thing I shouldn't have done. I mean, we look back to the worst habits and the worst moments in our lives, and we can always take that all the way back to like that one moment, that one time when we did that one thing, like, you know, that, that, that thing that we shouldn't have done. Like, I remember years ago, I used to smoke a lot. Uh, and and it, I, I can tell you when it started, it was whenever I met a girl that I liked and she smoked and I, and she, I, and I wanted to hang out with her. And in order to do that, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll take one. And it, it was that one moment that led to a struggle for years. And, and so the, the idea of what I'm talking about is like, what does God want you to want in his life, in your life? What does he want you to want? Because in, in five to 10 years from now, what story do you want to tell? You know, do you want it to be a story where I have financial freedom or one where you're in debt? Is it one where you want to tell the story that, that, that you have the right priorities in your life or that you're obsessed and addicted to your work? Is it one where you want to tell a story where you have a spiritually deep family or you're just a family that just calls yourself a Christian and shows up to church once or twice a year because you have to, you know, that only prays over the meal once, you know, at a blue moon and that's it. Do you want to tell a story where you're in a better shape or one where you well, I used to be in good shape. You know, what, what story do you want to tell? I'm not just talking about your walk with Jesus. We're talking about your life, the story of your life. And, and, and I believe that we have to ask ourselves that question. Well, what, what, what does God want you to want? He wants you to want the good story. And so the second question is sort of the application of the first one, which is, in order to get that, what do you need to start doing? And I think so often we get caught up in the idea that it needs to be like this big, big thing. And it really doesn't. It can be these little moments, you know, where you choose to get up in the morning and do something that's a little bit harder, but not, you know, so many times we look at our, if I want to tell a good story, then I have to start doing this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and we start naming these things and it's so overwhelming and we never do any of it. And I, I believe that God is saying, hey, let me write the story. Just, just take that little thing and just do that and build upon that. Build upon what, the, what God wants you to do and what, what he wants your story to be. Allow him to be the author of that. You know, we, we treat our, the story of our lives in the same way that a lot of us treat the idea of being a Christian. Like, well, I have to be right. I have to do good. I can't. I can't be a part of this yet because I'm a bad person. And Jesus multiple times said, hey, come as you are. I'll take care of the rest. And the same thing, I think, applies to the story of our lives. Um, you know, it, we have to make those little right decisions, you know, choosing that one thing, uh, you know. And, and so sometimes we need to choose to start that one little thing. Um, I think other times God wants us to choose to stop that one little thing too. That there are decisions we're making where he goes, hey, just stop that one thing. 
Um, I heard a great quote. There's a pastor up in Atlanta named Andy Stanley, and, and he had a great, great quote, and I love it. It's that, that direction, not intention, determines your destination. Um, and what does that mean? It means like, uh, I think everybody has good intentions. Or most people, the vast majority of us have good intentions. We have good intentions with what we do at work, with what we do with our family, with what we do in our lives. We have good intentions, but good intentions aren't going to determine where you end up. You can have good intentions all you want, but if the direction you're walking doesn't lead you there, then you'll never get there. If that makes sense, you know, um, and, and we can play that story out and make it a bigger deal. Like if I, it, and, and, and the question is sort of like, if you continue in the direction you're going right now, how does the story end? Like play it out in your mind. Uh, I remember I was uh, 16 years old and my best friend bought a motorcycle and this is like pre Craigslist. I, th I think he found it in the newspaper. Um, and so this would have been like the early nineties. The and classified bought, section. Yeah. The classifieds. And he bought a, <clears throat> like a 1970s Honda trail 90, um, which was a fun little bike, but it was an old bike at the time already. Um, and I wanted to drive it. Um, I had broken my ankle like a month before. And I was like, I want to drive it. And he's like, you have a cast on it. I go, ah, it's fine. It's a walking cast. I'll be fine. Uh, and so I, I was like, and so he's like, all right, go ahead. And so I'm taking, I'm, I'm scooting around the neighborhood, having a blast on this thing, 16 years old. You know, and I look back and I go, that one little decision to get on that motorcycle changed things for me. Um, I remember I was, I was driving down the road and I'm probably doing about 40, 45 miles an hour. And I'm coming up to like a T in the road where you have to turn right or left, because if you go straight, it's a drop off down into woods. And as I'm coming up towards that T I'm, I'm downshifting, it, it, but it was hard to downshift because the shifting was on my broken ankle with the, the cast. And so it was a little bit of a pain to try and angle my foot underneath it, but I was downshifting and, and I go to pull on the handbrake. And as I do this old motorcycle, the, the brake line snapped. And I was like, oh, crud. Uh, and I'm like, well, okay. So I start hitting the foot brake with my right foot and uh, it broke. Uh, so both of them broke at the same time. And I'm having a hard time downshifting. And so I'm, I'm coming towards this T in the road at probably about 20, 25 miles an hour. And I'm like, what do I do? Um, and I remember going, I guess I'm just going to try and make this turn and see what happens. And I angled, I took, I went to the left because that's where my cast was and laid down the motorcycle and it caught my ankle and spun me off into the woods. Um, that, not before dragging me a little bit and the motorcycle went off in the woods and destroyed the cast, like broke it up into pieces. Like the cast was disintegrated off my foot and uh, had to go back to the hospital uh get it recast but it was the emergency room this time and and it wasn't my uh orthopedic surgeon and so i ended up getting a cast that wasn't angled right and it led to me wearing a brace for a few years to get that ankle right all because i was stupid and made that one stupid decision to go ah, i can ride it i'll be fine um you know and and it's a funny story now you know 25 years later, but that one little decision led to years worth of problems. You know, I eventually had to have surgery on that ankle in my twenties. Uh, it's just sort of what we did. And, and so, you know, I, I think so often we, we, God wants us to start doing the right thing, but he also wants us to, to learn how to stop doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing in our lives to, to get where he wants you to go. And in the same way that God wants us to start doing the right thing, it's not always the big things. Sometimes it's just the little, little things that if we play it out in our head, it's, you know, it's so easy to justify things that we know probably aren't the best for us. 
but we justify it. Well, it's just this one little thing, but it really isn't because those little things lead to the story that we tell. Play it out to the end of the story. What, what is that one little decision you're making daily that you know isn't necessarily the best thing for you? Where does it lead? What story does it tell? Um, you know, in the same way that we, we don't understand, I, I think part of us, we, we, don't under, we don't understand what we're missing if we don't start doing the right things. In the same way, we don't understand what we're missing if we would stop. Um, you know, if you stop doing the things that are hurting you, all of a sudden you have margin in your life. All of a sudden you have time. All of a sudden you're not so overwhelmed. Why? Because you made that one little decision to fix things. Um, you know, play that decision forward, you know, smoking, um, addiction, there's that one little decision that leads to something that can really wreck your life. Um, you know, overspending, partying with your friends, all these little decisions that you make in the moment that lead to, you know, the stories we see in the news. They did, you know, people don't just jump to the, the worst thing that get them in the news. It started with one little decision. Um, and God wants you to want to have the right story, but he wants to be the one to write it. And we can't let him write it until we say, hey, I'm going to let you write it, God. You know, until we let you be the author and the perfecter of our faith. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, to, to understand all that kind of stuff, we have to learn how to make those changes. Um, you know, I hope that makes sense. But like, like they, there are those things where God wants us to make the right decisions. Uh, and so often we don't. Um, you know, I think there are times when God wants us to start doing the right things. And there's times when he wants us to stop doing the wrong things. I think there are times in life when God wants us to stay where we are, <clears throat> when it's easier for us to move on. Uh, there, there's a lot of times when it's easier to move. I remember I, I was uh, the first the first place I like truly was like a pastor. I was in it was in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and uh, I can talk about this because I, I I don't think Carlsbad, New Mexico is a hopping salt, salt strong magnet place um it's it's it basically as far away in the country as you can get from salt water uh so i'm not really worried about that uh but it was it was not a great place for me to live it was it wasn't very friendly i didn't have a lot of friends nobody really talked to me i lived out in the middle of like the high desert and uh i moved there to pastor at this church and almost immediately regretted it like i was i was so it was so hard um i had no friends i had nobody there to spend time with um, it was such a closed off group of people, um, up in the high desert out there. It's sort of weird because these people, like they, 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 they were born and they lived in their whole lives within this community that is separated from every other community around it. It's not like most of the country where the, the next town is 10 minutes away or 20 minutes away in between the two is multiple things. These towns are hours away from other towns and in between there's just nothing but desert there's just no, it's just like this little enclave of people and they're just by themselves and i wanted to quit like immediately i wanted to leave it would have been so much easier to leave and i remember god just saying no i've got a plan for you you need to stay and i spent about three years in this place where i was so unhappy in the moment but it also taught me so much more about being a leader and about being the pastor that I am. It led to the story that I have today. Had I not spent my time there, I wouldn't have ended up in Miami at the church I ended up with afterwards because three years before that position wasn't available. So I would have never ended up down there, uh, which is the place where I went and got healthy and lost weight and started riding my bicycle, which led to me doing my ministry where I traveled around the country, which led to me meeting my wife, which led to me having three awesome kids. Like you see uh, the decision to stay years before in a place where it would have been easier to leave because I wanted God to write my story. And I felt like God said, no, I want you to stay here. It didn't just teach me how to be a better leader. It led, it was a keystone moment that led to my life being what it was. Um, you know, and, and then I would honestly put 
the next one or the last one is sort of like the idea that sometimes God wants us to go. Um, I believe that sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it's easier to stay. And sometimes in the same way that sometimes it's easier to stay or easier to, to go, God wants you to stay. It, it, it's a lot of times you need to go when it's a lot easier to stay, you know, I, I, it's the idea of being able to say, you know, what is, once again, what does God want you to want in your life? What does he want you to do? Um, I remember in the same way that I, I wanted to leave Carlsbad, New Mexico so bad. When I went to Miami, I didn't want to leave that church because I loved it. I had such a great relationship with the pastor, with friends, like I, everything that I was missing in Carlsbad I found at my church in Miami and I loved it. I absolutely, I loved the city of Miami. I loved the area. I loved the people. Uh, I loved everything about it. I had gotten healthy there. My life was in a, in a good place and I didn't want to leave. And I felt God saying, Hey, I have something better for you. It's time to go. I felt God saying, you, you, you wanted me to write your story. Your story involves you leaving now. Um, and, and I remember going to the pastor uh, and talking to him about what I felt God leading me to do and him saying, Johnny, if God wants to write that in your story, you need to, you need to let him write it. You need to let him do it. And it was scary. I, 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 I in that story, in that moment, I, I ended up, it took me a couple of weeks to come to that place where I was comfortable letting God write that part of the story for me. Um, but I let him do it. And I, I sold almost everything I owned. I, you know, gave the keys back to my apartment. I'm, and I moved back up to where my parents lived so that I could start traveling around the country with no guarantee that it would work. Uh, and, and, it, and it led to the story of everything in, in, in my life of where I'm at right now. I mean, it led to me being here talking with you guys right now. Had I not done all these little decisions along the way, and those little decisions were decisions to just simply allow God to write the story for me, to start doing the little things when it was important, to stop doing the little things when it was important, to stay when he wanted me to stay, to go when he wanted me to go, to simply say, Jesus, let me follow your lead and what you want me to do. Um, my simple question today for everybody would be like, what, what about you? Like what, what's, what step of faith do you feel like God is leading you to do right now? And I'm not talking about like big things. I'm not talking about like quitting your job and with no plan or no idea of what to do. <laughs> um, don't do that. And don't, don't blame me if you do. Uh, I'm not telling you to do that, but is it something simple? Like, Asking that one person out on a date that you've been scared to because you feel like that's who God wants you to do. Um, maybe it's adopting or fostering children. Uh, maybe it's writing the first page of that book or going on a missions trip to help somebody else in another area. Maybe it's interviewing for that job. Maybe it's starting a small group at your church. Maybe it's simply getting up on Sunday morning to go to a church. What are those things? And, and, and why don't we do them? I, I think a big part of the reason we don't do a lot of this stuff is because we're afraid. Mm -hmm. um, we're afraid of failing. We're afraid of being ridiculed. Um, I think so often we aren't sure of ourselves because we're, we're looking at the big picture instead of the small one. We're looking at this big thing going, that one little thing isn't going to make a difference and I'm going to fail at the big idea and God's saying, just work on this, you know, and we understand that when it comes to like our kids, like we, our text is our youngest. We're, we're starting the potty training thing. And, and we have all these diapers and we have all these pull-ups. We have like both. We're in that stage. Uh, and we have underwear for them too, but we're not putting them in them yet. And, and so often we look at the decisions that we have like, hey, I have to go from diapers to underwear. 
Well, no, no. You can go from diapers to pull-ups during the day and di- diapers at night. And you slowly get through that. And then you go, okay, now I'm going to pull up day and night. And you slowly get through that. Well, now I'm going to pull ups at night and, and, and underwear during the day. And I slowly get through that. And we finally get to underwear all the time. We're this process, but we look at the, the end result of what we want. And we think we need to get there now. Uh, and, and I think that's tied to the world we live in, that, that instant results, instant, we, this is where I want to get, I have to do this right now, instant satisfaction, instant things, you know, it's the idea of like Amazon, like, you know, I, I, I need this, well, I'm going to go buy it on Amazon, oh, I can't get that for two days, I'm not buying it there, uh, I'll spend $20 more to get it tomorrow, you know, something that two years ago we would have waited a week for, or we would have driven the five miles to go buy in person, we 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 want, we want and that's the world we live in that instant satisfaction that instant end story and God's going let me write your story let me write it even even for Jesus his story did, it didn't start for thirty years like if you look at the Bible like you hear you know you learn a little bit about Jesus till he's about twelve years old and then you don't hear anything about him at all till he's thirty. Like there's 18 years that we don't know any, uh, really anything about what he did in his life at all. 18 years. And then he he was fishing clearly. Yeah. He he did some fishing, I'm sure. But you know, he did some, you know, woodworking and carpentry, you know, but, but even that we're just assuming based on who his family was and where he lived. We don't know. His story wasn't immediate. His story was he goes through all these 30 years and then he finally goes, okay, what am I going to do? And he didn't, he didn't, he didn't go at 30 years old from obscurity to preaching to 5,000 people. He went from at 30 years old, he went from obscurity to asking one group of guys, Hey, do you want to follow me? And then another group of guys, do you want to follow me? I want to help make your story better. I want to help you go from doing this to doing this. I want to help you go from just fishing for fish to fishing for men to changing the world. These little things. Why do we think that we have to do something that even Jesus didn't do? That God is calling us to to stay at times when it's harder, to go at times when it's harder, to, to start the things that are harder, to stop doing the things that are hard to stop. You know, it, the idea of failure keeps us, you know, from doing it. I'll do it later. You know, I, I, I'm not sure of myself. And, and, and really what it comes all down to is that we have to have faith that God is writing the story for us. You know, nobody's ever changed the world, like sitting on their butts. Like it just doesn't happen through all of history, you know, and, and, and sometimes it, it, it all comes down to having faith that God's in control. Uh, Hebrews, once again, my favorite book of the Bible. If we jump one chapter earlier, Hebrews chapter 11, God talks about Abraham. And he says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. That, that he didn't know the end of the story, but he did the, he took the first step. And he did it by faith. And and, and so the simple truth is that for us is that by faith, we need to decide sometimes to go, sometimes to stay, sometimes to start, sometimes to stop. And the reason we don't is because of fear. By fear, we go when it's easier to, you know, when we should stay, we we stay when we should go. We, We don't start. We don't stop. You don't. And you go, well, I don't, I don't have the faith to get to the end of the journey. But you don't have to. That's the cool part about faith, is that you don't have to have faith to get to the end of the journey. You have to have faith to start the journey. The, 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 the idea of following Jesus and letting him write the story of our lives is, is the idea of having enough faith to simply start you know, I imagine Peter standing there on the side of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus says, hey, come follow me. 
this guy just walks up and he, and he says, I'm going to make you fisherman. I'm going to make you great if you follow me. Peter didn't have to have the faith of what we see later in the Bible, the faith to, to preach, to, to be, to, you know, the Bible says that he became the, you know, the, the rock that the church was built on, that he preached and 3000 people came to know Jesus in one message. Like he didn't have to have faith for that. He had to have faith to put the net down and follow Jesus. He had to have faith to start doing this thing that God called him to do. You just have to have faith to make the first step. Uh, you know, I look at my life and it, I, where I'm at right now, and I trace it all the way back to that moment whenever I came to, to really know Jesus. You know, I was in my early 20s. I was in a rock and roll band. I was traveling around the country, <clears throat> doing a lot of things I shouldn't do. And I hap- just through God's timing, I ended up at a church service. And I remember that moment when I said, okay, God, I'm going to give you my life. I didn't have faith to be where I'm at right now at that moment. I didn't have to. I just had simply to have faith that I was going to let him be the one to write the story. Mm. And it would lead me to where I'm at and, you know, wherever he wanted me to go, that he would be the author of it. He writes better stories than I do. I love that my kids know Jesus. I love that they, my, you know, my, my oldest son, he prays better than me. I love it. I love that when he prays for people, he prays with all this, all of his guts. I love that my youngest won't go to sleep until he's, he, 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 he said the Lord's prayer with his brothers every night. He won't. I love that my, that's my three-year-old that he, it, it's simply all that started in that one moment, you know, 20 years ago when I'm sitting in this church service that I wasn't planning on being at and just God made it happen. And even that decision started before then, you know, our lives are built upon these little stories that change where we end up, you know, uh, you know, tie it back to fishing. You know, it's that idea. Like if you read these stories of people that are lost at sea, it all comes down to one dumb decision at the beginning of the trip. They didn't bring this. They didn't do this. They didn't pay attention to this. They didn't listen to this person. They didn't bring this piece of gear. They didn't have enough of this. They all these little, and and they lead to these scary moments in the same way that when we have a successful day out on the water, it doesn't happen because of what you did on the water that day. It happens because of what you did before. It's what, I mean, in a really broad spectrum, it's what Salt Strong's about. It's about making sure that you have a good story to tell at the end of the day of fishing. Mm. Our good stories happen because we watch videos and we ask questions and we're part of the community and we develop friendships and we learn the right things to do along the way. In the same way, God says, I want you to have a good story to tell. And in order to do that, let me write it for you. How, does that make sense? Is everything I'm saying? I know I've just sort of rambled. Oh, it does. I, I think... If I was listening, you know, my question, this is something I struggled with, is, is how, how do we know it, it, like, how did you know that day that God wanted you to go into that chapel? You're in a rock band, assume, you know, you're drinking, smoking, whatever. You, you, the church was probably one of the last things in your mind. How do you know? And, 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 and I want to hear your answer for me. It's mostly been praying. Even this, this unchurch. remember, I was super uncomfortable. I, I remember I was... Yeah my stomach churning that entire day before we recorded. That was a small deal. I mean, we're talking about just recording a 30, 45 minute podcast in the big scheme of things. I know it's not a big deal, but, uh, and it was a small step, right? I had to have faith this, this one. And now we're on episode over a hundred. Um, but that to me, it was praying and, and listening and, and it wasn't like I got some crazy vision of, you know, an angel appeared at my bed and told me I need to do unchurched, but it was this, it was, it was both heart, gut, whatever you want to call it. There was something there I knew, I knew I needed to do it. And it kept coming up and bugging me to the point, like it was almost like I was getting nudged 
there was just, it was, it's tough to, it's almost like explaining how you met your wife, right? You just knew, I, I knew with the second I met my wife in the first date, I was like, this is it. This is who I'm going to marry. I didn't have a vision. It wasn't, there wasn't arrows just pointing down to her. It was something in the, in the gut and the heart. Is that, do you find it similar in, in terms of, of doing those small, right things, taking the right steps, going in the right direction, starting? How do you, how do you discern that? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both of that. You know, I, th I think it all comes down to, once again, it comes down to the idea of having. It's, it's, it's faith. It, it, and and, and, and that, you know, that seems or it might feel like a cop out. But if you truly want. To have a good story to tell and you truly want God to be the author of your story. It starts with faith it starts with going okay god i believe that you're going to lead me in the right direction does that mean every decision you make is going to be the perfect one no but it also means that there are times when you might feel like the decision you're making is imperfect but if god if you feel like god is leading you that direction you allow and you allow that story to happen so that you can become where you are and get where you are i look at our church you know we walked through the last couple of years of a really scary moment, you know, leaving one church, one building to another building, losing that building because of COVID and spending a few months renting another facility. That might have felt like a mistake in the moment. But now I look back and I go, oh, wait, that was the best thing for our church, because had I not walked through that, we would never have gotten to where we are now, where God has enabled us to purchase a building. Now we don't we're not renting. We own and we're we'll able to grow and, and, and have a place that's our home. And it all comes down to faith. Just going, God, I'm going to believe that you're going to lead me in the right way. It comes down to simply saying, God, I'm going to trust in something I can't see. And it comes down to saying, I'm going to have faith that the decisions that you're leading me to do are right. And I think we all have that innate sense where we know what's easier to do in any given moment. We know the decisions we make that are easier and we have to be able to go, okay, God, is this really what you want me to do? Does that mean I spend every waking moment on every decision I make going, God, is this what you want me to do? Or is this not what? No, I don't do that. Nobody does that. But it does mean those moments when I, I feel that little twinge of like, is this the right thing to do? Should I do this? Is it the right thing to do? You know, it's the idea of, you're pulling into a parking lot and you nick a car next to you. Like you pull in fast and you get out and you look and there's no real mark on their car. There's no real mark on your car. What's the right thing to do? I say this because it's something that I did a few years ago. <laughs> I was betting you had. Yeah. <laughs> I was at Lowe's. And I, I sat there in my car for about 10 minutes mm. going, what do I do? And I just prayed. I said, God, what's the right decision here? It didn't leave a mark. It didn't do anything to their car. It didn't do anything to mine, but I would want to know. And so I went into Lowe's and said, hey, can you page whoever is driving this car? But it took me about 10 minutes to get there. And I went and told them and they came out and they looked at the car and said, no big deal, but thanks for letting me know. That little decision. Now, would, am, am I saying that I've had I drove, driven away, it would have led to the end of life as we know it for me? No. But it would have led to me being okay with doing the wrong thing in a little moment, which could mean that the next time when it's a bigger moment, I'd be okay with doing the wrong thing in a bigger way. It opens that door. And I have to have the faith in that moment to go, God, what do you want me to do? And then just trust that he's leading me in the right direction. And you go, well, Johnny, that's not an answer. It's the best answer I can give you. And I know that sucks, <laughs> but it comes down to faith. It comes, faith is, is being able to do something that you can't see because you feel like it's where you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to do and, and who you're supposed to follow and why you're supposed to follow it. That's what faith is, is doing something without proof, but trusting it.
And, and so how do you decide when that right thing is? It's making those small decisions to pray, to read your Bible, to go to church, to be a part of a, a community of people. The Bible calls us to be a part of the local church, to be a part of that community that we build each other up, we make each other better, and then allow those decisions to help guide us so that when those questions come in our head, we're operating from a good place to say, God, what do you want me to do? And have the faith to do it, even if it flies in the face of what we think we should be doing or what we want to do, what's comfortable. So I, I hope that helps answer it in a roundabout way. Yeah, that's uh, awesome, brother. Um, it just comes out of faith. It's good. Yeah. So good. Um, well, dude, this is uh this is this is why I love having you on, man. It's yeah. uh it's good. I mean, it's got me thinking about it. it is so it's such about the small things. One of my favorite books this year is The Compound Effect. And and every story you kept telling was reminding me of that. And and they start the story off. Uh, you know, we talked about the small decisions on whatever drinking doing bad things and it was about it was about eating right it's something we a lot of us struggle with i would say majority of americans would admit they're they're overweight either slightly or a lot yeah. and and we know what the answer is right it, right it's it's the small stuff it, it doesn't mean if tomorrow if you just go work out for five hours you're going to lose and that's what we all want we want that quick fix that pill that magic it's it's all the small things it's cutting out for me it was i did one time i cut out pretzels in my diet i eat pretzels every day I cut pretzels. I lost 10 pounds in less than a month by doing nothing but eliminating pretzels, that small mm -hmm. little thing. And so the whole book is about that, the compound effect, but, and it talks about that. It's like, it's, it's starting, it's having the faith to start whatever it is and taking those small little steps in the compounding, the flywheel effect. It will, it, it, it will, it will work. Uh, you just, you have to have faith that it'll work and you have to keep doing the right thing. So it was, that was awesome, man. Uh, for everyone listening, where can they go learn more about you? Last time you were all digital. Now you got your own new place there in Lakeland. I know you guys are yeah. in the midst of fixing it all up, but uh, where can they well, go? We're having service. Place? Yeah, we're having service every Sunday morning at 1030. Awesome. Uh, we meet at 300 Longfellow Boulevard. So it's Lakeland, uh, right down the street from Southeastern University, 300 Longfellow Boulevard. So uh, sort of on the east side of Lakeland, um, you know, about, just, you know, quarter mile off of memorial off 92 so a real easy place to get to um you can go to discoverfamilychurch.com or look us up on facebook discover family church in lakeland um and we'd love to have you 10 30 sunday mornings uh come early we got coffee and we use good creamer um mm -hmm. half and half and real like real like real international delights and stuff like we have oh, good wow. coffee Look at you guys. Uh, so if you need your coffee on sunday mornings come hang out we'd love to have you uh, yeah, it's, it's been really cool. We're seeing a lot of new people come and hang out and spend time with us. And, uh, it's been fun making a, a building and, and, and making it ours. And, and right now we're in the midst of sort of Christmas stuff and we have it decorated awesome, uh, for Christmas. And, and we're in, the, we're doing a series called, uh, a very Hallmark Christmas at Discover. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because I, I love Christmas movies at Hallmark. I do. Uh, I, I'm a cheesy guy like that. But we're, we're having a lot of fun with that. And so we'd love to have you out for that. Uh, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service, like a candlelight service. We'd love to have you out for that. If you're looking at, for some place to go on Christmas Eve, come on out at 5 p.m. I believe, yeah, 5 p.m. Uh, on Christmas Eve. Cool. Uh, and that's it. 300 Longfellow Boulevard, Lakeland, Florida. Uh, or if you have a question or anything like that, you need to email me. You just email Johnny. It's J-O-H-N-N-Y at discoverfamilychurch.com so yep and hopefully if you guys have listened to this podcast before i am joe j-o-e at saltstrong.com so i i was telling johnny off the record before that I, I always tell people to go leave a comment on the actual blog post at saltstrong.com forward slash unchurch that's where all the blog posts are and i rarely get that many comments but i leave my email and i get flooded with e which is awesome yeah. and i love that and i understand a lot of this stuff is is private when you start talking about you know, just things that we're dealing with struggles and yeah. challenges and, uh, and things to pray over. So uh, hit us up. We, we love, these are both our private emails. No one else is reading them yeah. and they never get forwarded or shared or anything. So I'd love to hear from you guys and appreciate you so much. And I, I appreciate you 
Pastor Johnny uh, coming back on. We need to go fishing again. That'll be one of those things where instead of just saying, "Hey, let's go do it," let's yeah. let's do it. Let's pick a date yeah. and make it happen. Let's so. do it. I want to. I want. I need to. I, I have not uh, fished nearly enough this year. Not nearly enough. I did get to go up to Maine. I caught my. I went striper fishing for the first time. I saw the pics, dude. Awesome. It's awesome. It was awesome. And then last month I was up in South Carolina and we went fishing for these big reds and it was insane. Like we spent a morning and by the like four hours into it, we looked at the guy and we go, we, we're done. Let's just go. <laughs> like We're tired. Like the way I mean, we call, I stopped counting how many reds we caught at like 30 and the smallest one we caught was over 30 inches. Like the oh, smallest one. It was insane. I've what never a had day. a day like that. Uh, so I've, I've had a couple of really good fishing trips, but I haven't had enough yep. fishing trips. And so I need to get out and catch me some fish. And and that's on you. You have to make the small choices, Joe, <laughs> to take me fishing. Uh, yeah, we'll have fun. And so <laughs> uh, love it. Cool, guys. Well, I appreciate you. Love you. And we will talk to you in the next episode. If not, uh, have a wonderful Christmas with you and your family. And uh, we'll chat soon. Thanks, buddy. Peace. Cause fishing, it's in my soul.